Nobody wants to get started. Do you realize we are down to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me again. We are down to our last five lectures. This is the last five lectures I will ever give to uh, a class because I'm um, finishing my classroom teaching at the end of next week. So this is uh, uh, a, an interesting uh, time for me too. So um, anyway, um, I want to uh, start a new topic. Uh, it's related to something I've been alluding to uh, a few times. And that is uh, gene expression. So gene expression is a, um, uh, as I mentioned briefly last time, is a, a critical topic, especially, well, for any cell, uh, as we will see, uh, because cells have to respond to the environments that they're in. If they are um, a multicellular, part of a multicellular organism or they're uh, part of a, just a, a single-celled organism. Um, and if they're part of a multicellular organism, then they have the, the added component that those cells also have to be responding to the needs of that organism. And so um, the ways that cells do this is by controlling the amount of each protein that they make. That amount can vary from zero uh, up to uh, a significant amount. You saw, for example, the DNA polymerase 3 uh, which is used in E. coli to uh, replicate DNA is not needed in very large amounts and so there are only about five or six uh, individual uh, enzyme or five or six molecules if you want to think about them that way for DNA polymerase 3 uh, that are made whereas EFTU I told you was the most abundant protein that was made in E. coli because um, there was a tremendous need for that. So cells have to be able to control that. And it's important, <coughs> excuse me, that cells do that because if they don't control things properly, then they will either have something around that's doing something they don't want it to do at the wrong time, or more importantly, and this is particularly the case for prokaryotic cells, they may be wasting energy making something that they don't need. We're going to see some processes happening with, multi from, with cells in multicellular organisms that don't even seem very efficient. Uh, because they make things and then they break them down or, or uh, demolish them. Um, but they are uh, important for uh, being controlled. That is that um, a, a cell goes to a lot of trouble to make certain messenger RNAs and then breaks them down. And it's more important to do that than it is to have uh, that messenger RNA sitting around doing something that the cell doesn't want it to do. So we'll see something about that as I talk about eukaryotic cells uh, later. What I want to start with first uh, is to talk about the situation in bacteria. Um, and I want to talk about two uh, of the most uh, uh, widely studied uh, phenomena there uh, relating to two things we call operons. So before I do that, I need to t tell you a little bit about what operons are. So operons are something that we see in E. coli. We don't see them in higher cells. And operons are a set of genes all under the same control of the same promoter. And those genes are expressed on the same messenger RNA. So I told you that in prokaryotic cells, we could have polycystronic messenger RNAs, meaning that we could have multiple genes on the same messenger RNA. So an operon okay, will have, as another way of describing those messages being on the same um, uh, chunk, basically. We think of operons with respect to DNA, not RNA. So they are under the control of a common promoter, which means that they are in DNA. They get made into RNA, at which point we, would, we describe them as polycystronic. We don't see, <clears throat> as I mentioned uh, previously, we don't see a similar situation in eukaryotic cells because eukaryotic cells have one gene per messenger RNA. Well, let's think about the, that um, prokaryotic cell and talk about, first of all, uh, a very uh, interesting uh, operon known as the uh, LAC operon. Before I do that, I want to just uh, remind us here, of course, of the central dogma, DNA going to RNA going to uh, protein. Um, and I also want to um, describe very briefly some of the ways in which um, gene expression is controlled. So gene expression, of course, is 
ultimately relating to the amount of functional protein that is made for any given gene. So gene expression relates to the amount of functional protein that's made for any given gene. And the things that you see on the screen are mechanisms, processes that the cell has where the cell can exert some control. The simplest of those is transcription. If a cell has a strong promoter, the cell is going to make a lot of messenger RNA. Okay? If a, cell, if a, a gene has a weak promoter, it's going to, the cell is not going to make as much of that messenger RNA. So we can imagine a lot of messenger RNA is going to result in production of a lot of protein, whereas a little messenger RNA is going to result in production of a little bit of protein. Okay? Uh, splicing in eukaryotic cells. All right? Cells, uh, I showed you how cells, for example, could do alternative splicing, and they could mix and match um, exons to some extent. And that also provides uh, organisms with a level of control for which of the sequences are actually made uh, from a given, uh, me uh, from a given um, uh, messenger RNA as it's originally coded. Polyadenylation was another. Messenger RNA stability is not something that I have uh, addressed here uh, directly, although I have talked about the role of the cap and the three prime uh, poly A tail in giving some stability to messages. And those do play roles as well in helping to uh, determine the half-life or how long a messenger RNA is around. Translation um, is not something I will talk about directly in terms of um, control of gene expression, but you could imagine that if a given messenger RNA is more efficiently translated, that it could make more protein than a similar messenger RNA that's not efficiently translated. And so that is another level of control that cells have. And the last one that I'll mention here, and there are others by the way, but the last one I'll mention here is protein stability. And cells break down proteins like they break down messenger RNAs. That is, they have enzymes that will, um, in some cases, uh, chop them into bits. Um, proteins can get damaged, and damaged proteins could wreak havoc in a cell. So when cells uh, sense that they have a protein that's damaged, uh, they will target it for destruction, and there are um, complexes inside of cells uh, that will do that. So all these mechanisms, or all these controls, help to control how much of a given protein that a cell has at any given time. So now I want to do what I said earlier, which is to turn attention to talking about um, a bacterial system known as the LAC operon. The LAC operon is probably the most studied um, Operon, the most studied gene expression system uh, in the entire world. Okay? It relates to, <clears throat> um, first of all, the LAC operon has three genes associated with it. We're going to talk about uh, basically one of those genes, okay? but it has three genes associated with it. The three genes all play roles in allowing a bacterium to metabolize the sugar lactose. So the three genes are necessary for a bacterial cell to metabolize the, the, the sugar lactose. Lactose is not always present in the environment where a cell is located. Okay? So for example, in the human gut, um, the human gut is full of E. coli. Uh, lactose is known as milk sugar. Okay? I, uh, as an example, don't drink a lot of milk. I eat a little bit of ice cream, but I don't drink uh, a lot of milk. And even if I drank a lot of milk, there would be times during the day when my, the milk I had drunk had been all basically used up, right? So I wouldn't have a constant supply of milk in my uh, intestinal system so that bacteria would be constantly having available milk that they would want, or available lactose that they, from that milk that they would want to uh, break down. Remember that a bacterial cycle of life when there's abundant food is about 20 minutes. So we could go for several lifetimes, even if I was a reasonable uh, milk drinker during the day, we could go several lifetimes of cells where there would be no lactose present. Well, if that bacterial cell is making enzymes necessary to break down lactose, it's completely wasting its time. Okay? So it's got to be able to turn that on and turn that off as appropriate. And as we'll see, 
<clears throat> the bacterium has figured out a very elegant and simple way of controlling that. Okay? All right, so the lac operon has those three genes. Now, what we're looking at here is what I like to think of as the sort of control region for transcriptional expression. So this mechanism for controlling uh, the uh, lac operon operates at the level of transcription. Okay? Operates at the level of transcription. The transcriptional control region here has three components to it that you can see. One you've already seen before, and that's the promoter shown in yellow. The promoter is the place where the RNA polymerase binds and wants to do its thing. Okay? There are two other regions on here uh, that are relevant for our understanding. Okay? They are. On the right side, we have something called the operator. The world doesn't have operators anymore, right? used to have operators. We have op an operator is a binding site for a protein known as the lac repressor. Very important protein, the lac repressor. And if you look at this, you can see that the RNA polymerase uh, promoter site uh, stretches from about here into this sort of greenish region. And if you look at the binding site of the repressor, known as the operator, then you see that that blue overlaps with that green region. The green happens because both yellow and blue uh, intersect at that point. That means, therefore, that the operator overlaps with the promoter. The third region that's on here is shown in a lighter green. And that lighter green region is known as the cap binding site. The cap is, as we will see, is a protein that also binds to the uh, DNA. Now, we're looking at DNA here, by the way, double-stranded DNA. We're not looking at RNA. We're looking at DNA. Transcriptional control is going to determine whether or not RNA is made. That's what's happening in transcriptional control. So let's take a look uh, at another level to see how this system operates and what's involved with it. Actually, I, I, I'm jumping ahead. Let me, let, me sit, let me describe this to you first. So this is not how the system operates. This is showing you uh, the transcription of that region. I'll show you how that transcription is controlled in a second. But I want to focus on what's happening in the making of this messenger RNA and in its translation. One of the things that happens in a polycystronic message is that the ribosome gets started with the first of the uh, trans, uh, translational open reading frames and it translates that. And by the way, an open reading frame is the coding region for a protein. That's what that is. It's called open reading frame because it has no stop codons in it. It's open. It's free of those. So the first coding region, the ribosomes bind to, they start translation, they do their thing. They get to the stop codon, what's going to happen? Well, the stop codon is a signal to, for everything to fall apart, and it comes all off. Well, you've got a second gene on here, and you've got a third gene on here that the uh, cell wants to translate. How does that go about? It goes about in just the same way it went for the first one. And this is why in bacteria there's a shine delgarno sequence. Because remember I said that not every AUG is a start codon. And the cell wants to be able to figure out which one is the start codon. And if you have multiple genes on a given messenger, or genes expressed on a given messenger RNA, then you're going to have multiple start codons. And each one of those is going to have a shine delgarno sequence. Each one of those is going to have a shine delgarno sequence. So now the cell simply assembles the ribosome for the second coding region. It translates it. It assembles it for the third one. It translates it. And it makes these three genes. These three genes, we're going to focus on the first one. It's called beta galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase is an enzyme that takes lactose and breaks it into two sugars that make it up. 
galactose, and glucose. And because this enzyme is present, then the energy that's in lactose can be used by the cell. Glucose can be metabolized in glycolysis. Galactose can readily be converted into glucose and then metabolized in, in glycolysis. But lactose by itself can't be metabolized. Okay? Make sense? All right. Let's look then at how this transcription is actually regulated. Okay? I'm going to start right here. This shows an overview of the same thing that I've just showed you before. Here's the operator, here's the RNA polymerase binding site, and here's the cap site. And then here's that overlapping region. That overlapping region turns out to be critical for the control of this operon. What the LAC repressor does, the LAC repressor is a protein. It's a protein that recognizes and binds to the operator. All right? And you can see it doing its thing right here. And when the repressor recognizes and binds to its operator, it overlaps with the promoter site. And even though the RNA polymerase would like to bind, it can't because part of its binding site is covered up. So when the LAC repressor is bound to the operator, the RNA polymerase cannot bind and transcription cannot occur. That's a very, very efficient system. Because once it's bound, there's nothing that's going to happen. Well, I've told you that bacterial cells need to sometimes make this. Right? If there's no lactose present, we would want to have transcription of the operon turned off because you don't want to be wasting the energy necessary to make enzymes that the cell is not going to need. On the other hand, we do want to be transcribing, not we, the bacterial cell does want to be transcribing that operon when lactose is present. Well, it turns out that lactose is, and actually it's a derivative of lactose that I'll describe in a minute, but for our purposes for the moment, you can think about lactose. Lactose binds to the repressor. And when lactose binds to the repressor, it changes the structure of the repressor so that it can no longer bind to the operator. This is really simple. Lactose basically tells the cell, I'm here. And by being here, the repressor is turned off. And now transcription can occur. Very, very simple. It's slightly more complicated than that. It's always slightly more complicated than that, right? And I'll tell you the complications. It's not much more complicated. One complication is it's not really lactose. It's a modif modified form of lactose known as allolactose. Sorry, known as allolactose. There's lactose. There's allolactose. Why does the cell modify lactose to get allolactose? I don't have an answer for you. If you think about it in terms of lactose, you're OK. If I ask you the question on the exam what the molecule is, I want you to tell me it's allolactose. You don't have to know why it's allolactose, but that's what it is. Allolactose is made from lactose. Okay? So allolactose is the molecule that binds to the repressor, keeps the repressor from binding to the operator. When the repressor can't bind to the operator, the RNA polymerase can, in fact, bind to the promoter, and transcription can start. Simple. One other complication. Remember how I said that if we look at the TATAAT sequence in bacteria, and we had that consensus sequence, and I said if promoters are close to that consensus sequence, they will be strong promoters. And if they're not close, they won't be so strong. Turns out that the promoter on the LAC uh, promoter is not very strong. But when lactose is present, that cell wants to be churning out a lot of this operon because it wants to metabolize lactose. That's where the cap binding site comes into play. The cap binding site comes into play 
Because when cap binds to the cap site, I should pull up the, the figure, when cap binds to the cap site, then the RNA polymerase is actually assisted in binding to the, um, in binding to the uh, promoter. Right? So this actually shows that process happening. Cap is a protein, cyclic AMP binding protein. That's where the cap part comes from. You can just call it cap. Okay? Cap can bind a molecule also. And the molecule that cap binds is cyclic AMP, C-A-M-P. When do bacterial cells make C-A-M-P? When they're running out of energy. When they're running out of energy, it's a sign we start making cyclic AMP. Okay, it happens in bacterial cells. Now let's think about this. If the um, lactose is present and the cell uh, has uh, 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 lactose converted into allolactose, then the repressor can't bind. And let's assume this cell has plenty of energy. Let's say the cell, in addition to having lactose, also has a ton of glucose around. Right? Everybody got that pictured? Cell's got plenty of energy. It's not going to be making much cyclic AMP. It's not going to be making, I mean, it's, it's not going to be binding to cap, and consequently cap will not be binding to the DNA. By the way, binding of cyclic AMP by cap causes it to bind to the DNA. Cap will only bind to the DNA when cyclic AMP is present. Now, cell's got plenty of energy. It's not making cyclic AMP. It doesn't have cap binding to, uh, uh, to the, the cap binding site. So it's only going to be making a little bit of the lac operon. A little bit's OK. Because there is lactose. It can use it, right? Doesn't hurt anything. But the cell is not relying on that operon to provide the enzymes necessary to break down lactose because lactose is not the only energy source. There's also glucose present. Now let's think about the situation where the cell has no glucose. The only energy source that the cell has available to it is lactose. What's going to happen? Well, lactose is going to be converted into allolactose, binds the repressor, so the promoter is left open. And for a while, the cell makes a little bit of the lac operon, but the cell starts running out of energy because it's not making enough stuff. And when it starts running out of energy, what's it going to do? It's going to make cyclic AMP. And when cyclic AMP is made, it binds to cap, and cap binds to the cap binding site. And now RNA polymerase sees this as the best place in the whole genome to bind, and it starts binding and binding and making a ton of that operon. So what I've just described to you is how the cell uses a very simple system to make no operon, to make a little bit of operon, or to make a lot of operon. All right, two components, cap and the lac repressor. Questions about that? Everybody's amazed and stunned. Or they're saying, no, there's only four more lectures after today, right? All right. Quite, no questions, really? OK. That is the lac operon. I want to talk about another operon that has two sets of controls. One of them is kind of like the lac operon. Okay? The other one is kind of like the lac operon. This is known as the tryptophan operon. And what I'm going to describe to you here for the tryptophan operon is true for several other amino acid operons in E. coli. You'll see that some of the things I'll talk about here make very good sense for operons involved in the synthesis of amino acids. So the trip operon is involved in the synthesis of the amino acid tryptophan. 
Tryptophan is one of the 20 amino acids that cells have to have. And the cell wants to be making the proteins necessary to make tryptophan when tryptophan is not abundant, but it doesn't want to be making the proteins necessary for that when tryptophan is abundant. So how does it control it? Well, as I said, there's two levels of control. The first level of control is like we saw in the LAC operon. There's a tryptophan repressor. A tryptophan repressor. And the tryptophan repressor binds to, surprise, tryptophan. The tryptophan repressor is backwards from the LAC repressor. The LAC repressor only bound to the uh, operator when there was no uh, lactose. The tryptophan repressor, on the other hand, binds to the tryptophan operator only when there's tryptophan present. That makes sense. When there's tryptophan present, don't want to be making this, right? So the repressor binds directly and turns it off. In the lac repressor case, all right, it was the presence of lactose that we wanted to turn the operon on. In this case, the presence of tryptophan, we want to turn this off because we've got plenty of tryptophan. We're not trying to make lactose, we're trying to break it down. We're not trying to break down tryptophan, we're trying to make it. So we have opposite needs here. So the tryptophan repressor binds to the tryptophan opera, uh, operator when tryptophan is present and only when it's present. Okay. Well, if tryptophan is present, what's going to happen to the RNA polymerase? Can it bind to the promoter? Nope. Is transcription of the operon going to occur? Nope. Are the proteins necessary for making tryptophan going to be made? Nope. Okay. Everything's fine and dandy. This system works pretty well, but it's not perfect. It's estimated that it works about 90% of the time. But there's some bleed through or breakthrough where this operon actually does get transcribed sometimes when the cell doesn't want it to be transcribed. So because of this, the cell has a backup system for controlling the transcription. And it's more complicated. It uses a phenomenon known as attenuation. Okay? It uses a phenomenon known as attenuation. And this process involves transcriptional termination as a control mechanism. Now remember I talked about factor independent transcription termination. And I said that an RNA could form a duplex that acted like a jack to lift the polymerase off of the DNA and have the whole complex fall apart. This mechanism I'm getting ready to describe to you involving attenuation acts like that system where we have factor independent termination of transcription. Now in the tryptophan operon, transcription starts. Okay? Even if the cell doesn't want to make it, transcription starts if this system doesn't work perfectly. And I've already told you it doesn't work perfectly. All right? So we want to stop that transcription after it starts if that is no longer desired. And so that's what attenuation is all about. This schematically shows what's happening in uh, attenuation. To orient you, let's focus on the top half of the screen. And we've got a high level of tryptophan. And the uh, tryptophan repressor has not worked the way we wanted it to work, or the cell wanted it to work. So transcription got started. Well, remember that we're in E. coli. And I told you that in E. coli, transcription and translation occur at the same place. They're both occurring in the cytoplasm. So transcription starts, and we see production of a messenger RNA. There's the five prime end of the messenger. There's the DNA down here. There's the five prime end of the messenger RNA. And you see some regions here labeled one, two, three, and four. Okay. The tryptophan operon has several coding regions for tryptophan genes, and it also has a very odd little region at the very beginning called a leader. Take me to your leader, right? It has a very 
tiny region called a liter. And that is a region that can be translated. It only makes about 15 or 20 amino acid protein. And it turns out the cell doesn't use the protein for anything. You'll see why it's important in a second. This leader is located as the very first coding region on that messenger RNA. So it's the very first thing that the ribosome is going to try to translate. The RNA starts to be made, the ribosome grabs a hold of it and starts translating. And it hits that leader region. And if there is abundant tryptophan, the ribosome moves along its merry way. Nothing slows it down, nothing stops it. And it gets to this point that I'm showing you on here that says 1 and 2. Notice that the ribosome is covering up regions 1 and 2. That will become important. And the ribosome can only cover up both of these regions if it moves fast. Why is the ribosome moving fast critical? Well, it turns out that that leader region, when we look at the amino acids that it specifies to be put into this little tiny protein, this leader region contains several codons for tryptophan. Now, if tryptophan is abundant, the ribosome grabs those amino acids, it puts them in, and it makes that, and it slides along rapidly, covering up regions 1 and 2. When 1 and 2 get covered up, regions 3 and 4 can pair with each other. Okay. Now I should point out that there's two possible sets of pairings that can happen here. Okay. 3 and 4 can pair with each other, or 2 and 3 can pair with each other. If the ribosome is covering up 2 because it moved fast, it allows 3 and 4 to pair with each other. And when 3 and 4 pair with each other, it makes that jack that I described before, and you get transcriptional termination. Transcription does not proceed any further. So only a short region of that operon got made when tryptophan was abundant. On the other hand, if tryptophan is not abundant, what happens? The ribosome starts translating, it gets to region 1, and region 1 says, I need several tryptophans here. And they're in very low concentration, so what happens? The ribosome sits and waits for tryptophan to diffuse into there. And because it sits and waits, 2 is not covered up. 2 can pair with 3. And 2 pairing with 3 does not make a transcriptional terminator. Even though it makes something that looks like it, it's not a transcriptional terminator. Consequently, 3 can't pair with 4. And because 3 can't pair with 4, the RNA polymerase has nothing to stop it, so it just goes scooting through the operon. So in low concentrations of tryptophan, transcription of the entire operon occurs. In high concentrations of tryptophan, premature termination of that caused by the pairing of 2 and 3 occurs, and the entire operon is not transcribed. Now, usually causes a fair number of questions, so let me take any questions that you might have about that. I'm either getting very clear in my old age, or you guys are not wanting to ask questions, or you're so confused you don't know how to ask a question. Yes. Yes. So two, if 2 and 3 pair, transcription continues, because what it takes to terminate transcription is 3 and 4 pairing. So since 2 and 3 pair, 3 and 4 can't pair. OK? So the pairing of 2 and 3 allows for the full transcription of the entire operon. Rania. Can you just clarify the leader region? Is that yes. Yeah. Is the, the leader region is found, is coded in the DNA, of course, but then it appears in the RNA because that's where uh, the, uh, the RNA is made from the DNA. Let me show you the uh, original figure. All right. 
Here's the uh, entire region of the operon, and you can see that the leader is located right here. It's the very first reading frame that can be translated. And the thing that's labeled attenuator, that's simply those coding things for tryptophan. That's all it is. Codons for tryptophan are what the attenuator is. Okay, you probably will have questions, and I understand that. If you have questions and you don't understand that, then please come to see me. I'll be happy to help you. Yes, sir? Uh, just a quick clarification. So the TRPL on that image, that'll be, uh, what's the label that's meter? Yes. Yeah, so that would just be one coding region on the other. Okay, so the coding region one would actually occur in here, yes. I'm not going to ask you to draw that and show me that because I use those numbers just sort of schematically to show you the, the overall thing. But yes, that would be located in there. Let me show you one other figure that may help you to place that uh, just a little bit. I haven't shown you the other figure. And that's this guy right here. This shows that messenger RNA, what it looks like. It includes the entire leader region. And you can see that there's uh, the attenuator right there. Um, that's contained within uh, the region one. This is 50 nucleotides in before we start to see the attenuator uh, appearing. So this shows regions one and two. One and two can also pair, by the way. Pairing, uh, that's not really relevant for our purposes. The important thing is that three and four can pair when one and two are occupied with something. It could be the ribosome, as we see. However, if one and two are not occupied because the ribosome is sitting on here, covering up one but not covering up two, then two and three will pair. So this corresponded to the top figure, this corresponded to the bottom figure. High tryptophan, low tryptophan. Does that help? Yes? The point of them pairing over here isn't really significant. What happens is the most important thing is that these are allowed to pair. So the pairing over here is that this is a transcriptional terminator. The fact that they can form that structure means that uh, transcription will terminate at that point once this thing forms. On the other hand, over here they can't pair, and 3 and 4 therefore can't form that transcriptional terminator, so transcription proceeds. Does that make sense? Okay, look it over and come see me if you have questions about that. Well, the things I've just shown you here, I'm going to show you one other thing that happens in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, actually. It's called riboswitches. Involves no um, um, factors. We saw factor-independent termination, and it worked very much like what I'm showing you here. The jack forms, the RNA polymerase gets lifted off, etc. There were no proteins involved in that. And I also showed you a factor dependent mechanism. I'm going to show you a different factor dependent termination mechanism in just a second. Okay? So the one I showed you before involved the row protein, where the row kind of slid up that rope to catch the RNA polymerase and kick it off. There are other factors that can play a role in transcription termination, and they're involved in the process uh, of control known as riboswitches. Riboswitches. What are riboswitches? I mentioned to you that in translation, the 23S ribosomal RNA could act as a catalyst. And I told you that it could catalyze the formation of peptide bonds. And if you remember anything about enzymes from last term, you know that the active site of an enzyme is a very special place, usually in the interior of an enzyme, that forms after a protein folds. It tells, you, it tells us that an enzyme has a three-dimensional structure. Right? And the fact that an RNA can catalyze a reaction it should also tell you that an RNA can form, in some cases, a three-dimensional structure, and it can. So if the right sequences are present, then an RNA can form a three-dimensional structure, and that three-dimensional structure, in the case of a ribozyme, can catalyze a reaction. In the other case, it can bind molecules, and that's what's happening in a riboswitch. 
Okay? A ribose switch starts out kind of like we saw the factor independent mechanism. The RNA starts being made and a structure can form. We see a depiction of that structure here. We see the depiction of this structure here in the absence of a molecule that the ribose switch would bind to. That's labeled as M. So it says minus M, meaning that M is absent. M could be, for example, tryptophan. Right? Tryptophan, ab I, by the way, I don't want to confuse this. I'm just using that as an example. Okay? That, tryptophan doesn't use this mechanism, but that, just as a molecule. Let's call this ahernium. Okay? So the molecule ahernium is not present. All right? Then we see the structure on the left form, and the cell decides if this molecule is not present, we don't need the enzymes to break it down, so we're going to stop transcription. Absence of ahernium, no enzymes necessary to break it down, we're going to stop it, and this structure forms, and consequently transcription of that operon stops. On the other hand, if ahernium is present, ahernium combined in that three-dimensional RNA structure that can form, and when it does, it prevents the formation of the transcriptional terminator so that transcription continues. And I've got it backwards, don't I? Anti-terminator. All right. Sorry. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't do it off the top of my head. You'd think after 20 years of doing this, I would have learned, don't do it off the top of your head because you get it backwards, and I got it backwards. All right. So, in this case, we're forming an anti-terminator, meaning that transcription can continue. It could be the other way around as well. But in this case, the example I've shown, that the anti-terminator is what's happening. Transcription continues. When ahernium is present, in this case, it causes transcription to stop. So that would be analogous to the tryptophan, for example. When we have tryptophan, we don't want to be making the operon. When we don't have tryptophan, we do want to be making the operon. Right? The only difference between this and what we saw before is that there's a factor that's causing it to happen, the factor being the molecule M. In the last scheme I showed you, there was no molecule M. The structure of the terminator formed by itself and terminated transcription. Okay, that's how a riboswitch works. And that's what a riboswitch does. Riboswitches are found both in bacteria and in eukaryotic cells. So this is a, an efficient and powerful mechanism for controlling transcription. You can see the cell is, in fact, wasting some energy because it starts making a messenger RNA, but it doesn't make the entire messenger RNA when it's not needed. Yeah, yeah. Just to clarify, um, the absence of M does not always correspond to anti-terminator? Yeah, good question. So his question is, the absence of M does not always correspond to the absence of termination, and that's correct. So depending upon the system that we're in, this could be termination or not termination, depending upon what the needs of the cell are. Right, right. But it'll always be consistent for one given system. Let's say I've got a system for a hernium, right, and I need it or I don't need it, but I might have an opposite thing for tryptophan, for example. Okay? Yeah, good question. Thank you for asking that. Yes, Rania. Does attenuation always involve riboswitches? Attenuation does not involve riboswitches. Okay? Riboswitches have factors. Attenuation does not have factors. So you see that there's a binding of a factor here that's causing this difference in structure. We didn't see that in the case of the um, tryptophan operon. One other thing I should mention is, and I, I mentioned it briefly before, other amino acid operons use attenuation just like tryptophan operon does. And if you think about this, this makes very good sense. Let's say the cell needs valine, right? It could use exactly the same system of pausing the ribosome when valine's low, right? Allowing the transcription to continue. Or um, if valine's abundant, then covering up that region too and allowing the terminator to form and stopping transcription when valine is abundant. Okay? And so uh, E. coli uses attenuation in four or five 
of its amino acid operons. It only works for amino acids because amino acids are needed to make proteins. We can't do it for other things because they're not involved in the translation process. Okay? Yes, question. So the tryptophan operon is factor independent. There's, no, there's nothing binding to the RNA. Nothing is binding to the RNA. There's nothing that's changing that structure like a molecule, like a hernium or something. Okay? Okay, that's a fair amount of information. That's about as far as I wanted to get today. So let's stop it there. We've been talking a lot about complexes. And so today's song is about complexes. It's called God Bless These Complexes. All information in cells DNA just increases with pieces mixed and matched in the mRNAs linking exons all together using SNRPs in complex S God bless the spliceosomes and transcriptomes God bless the spliceosomes and my genome. Your blueprint info is in DNA. Since you need it, proofread it. Or you'll mutate the mRNA. You can translate all the codons with the cell's genetic code. God bless the ribosomes. They translate code. God bless the ribosomes and proteins. I can't do that. <laughs> All right, guys. See you on Friday. <laughs>